In 1881, Mark Twain wrote a novel for his two daughters, Susie and Clara Clements. He had recently returned from England and was fascinated by British history. And that's where he got the idea for this story. It's about two young men who happen to look very much like each other. One of them is a poor boy from one of the poorest parts of London. The other is the Prince of Wales. The name of the novel is called The Prince and the Pauper. And I'm sure you've heard this novel. It's a story about this chance meeting between two young men who happen to look very, very much identical. And so they switch identities. And one lives, the poor man lives as the prince and the prince comes and lives as the poor man. And according to Mark Twain, this is a story for young people of all ages. And of course, it appeals to the young. It appeals to his daughters because we love the idea of somebody who is growing up poor, all of a sudden being thrust into the palace and living like a rich person. But it also appeals to older people because we would all love it if our leaders would at some point in their life understand what it's like to live as a poor person. So many of the rich people out there, right? They have never done any backbreaking work in their life and that impacts how they lead people. And so we like the idea of somebody from the 1% being thrust into the 99% and living their life for a while. But I don't know if you know this, but this actually happened to one of our leaders. John F. Kennedy, when he was 19 years old, was stricken with this sickness. And somebody suggested that he should go to a sunshine state and heal from this sickness. And so he had met this guy. His name is Jack Spiden. And he had a ranch in southern Arizona. And so it was suggested that JFK and his brother go out to this ranch and do some hard labor. Arizona has a long history as being a place where health seekers go to heal from their sicknesses. Spiden was an American stockbroker uh, who, like very many other people, lost everything in the Great Depression. And one of his friends told him that maybe you should go become a rancher in southern Arizona. And so he did. He came to Mescal, Arizona and started a ranch called the J6 Ranch. And it was at this ranch that JFK and his brother came and worked in the summer. According to history, historian Michael O'Brien, it was the first job that either of these two had ever had. And they were only paid a dollar a day. Back in those days, that's what they were paid. And according to them, they, according to the historians, they were there, they worked, they wrangled cows. And while they were there, they built a house. Actually, they built an office. And this office apparently still exists to this day. I have a picture of it. But the fact is, I can't find it. Because like most historical places, it's been wiped from the internet so people and gawkers don't go and start taking pieces of this house, which would inevitably happen. So if any of you know where this house is, please let me know because I've looked on Google Maps, I've looked everywhere, I cannot find this house. But this is the house that Jack built. Jack and his brother, it's the, it's the house where he sweated and labored to build one summer, many, many moons ago. You know, when God kicked us out of the Garden of Eden, he said that our life would be hard, that growing food would be a challenge, and finding shelter is a challenge. Life would be a challenge. It would involve some amount of pain, and whole industries have sprung up to help us reduce that pain. But my friends, life is pain, at least according to the poor farm boy Wesley in the movie, The Princess Bride. During Lent, 
We've been looking at what scripture says about suffering, and we've been dancing around scripture to see what God says about suffering. And today is no different. We're going to go to a passage of scripture from the Apostle Peter to see what he says about suffering. We're going to learn about what the Apostle says. Now, earlier in this chapter, Peter says, don't repay evil with evil. Be compassionate and be humble. But then in 1 Peter 3, beginning at verse 13, he says this. Who is going to harm you if you're eager, eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Peter says you will suffer. And sometimes you will suffer for doing wrong. But sometimes you will suffer for doing right. In other words, if you are human, you will suffer. So if that's the case, it is better to suffer for doing right than doing wrong. And when you suffer for doing right, you will be blessed. The Christian view of suffering has at least these three components. And the first is this, that suffering is a result of the fall. We mostly cause our own suffering for the things that we do, but we can't avoid it completely because suffering is a part of the fall. In John chapter nine, Jesus uh, was walking with his disciples and they come across this blind man who was blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, he says, who sinned that this guy is blind? Was it his parents that sinned or was it this man who was blind? Is it him that sinned? And Jesus said it wasn't his parents and it wasn't this man. He was blind to show forth my glory. And then Jesus reaches down and heals him. You see, there are times when Jesus healed, but we don't believe that being blind was a repayment for sin. We believe that, that suffering simply is because of the fall. You know, we've had... Uh, Many times this organization called Crossing Cambodia, and they've been into our congregation and they've shared what they're doing in Badambang, Cambodia. Greg Holtz, who started that organization, was there in Badambang and noticed all these street urchins. And while he was there, he says, I want to help them out. But the people of Badambang said, you can't help these people out. They are suffering because in a previous life, they were very, very bad people. But that's not what Jesus teaches. Jesus does not teach that our suffering is a retribution for the bad things we've done. What scripture teaches is that all suffering is a result of the fall. But all people deserve the compassion of a loving Savior. We do not teach that we are suffering because we've done wrong. We teach that we're suffering because of the fall of mankind. And that brings about suffering. But we also teach that God has a plan in suffering. He doesn't cause the suffering, but then he can use that suffering as his part of his eternal plan. We read in Romans that all things work for good who love, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We know that, that God is in the midst of suffering. There was a, ship rock wreck and the ship came onto a small uninhabited island and this man who survived the shipwreck cries out for God to save him and every day he scans the horizon to see if anybody any ship passes by so that they could come and save this man and every day day after day no ships came and so exhaustedly he eventually managed to build a house and he put a few, his very few possessions in it. And then one day he was out hunting for food and he came back and the house had burned down. He arrived to find his little hut in flames, smoke rolling up to the skies. The worst had happened. He was stung with grief. But early the next day, a ship drew near to the island and they rescued him. And he said, how did you know I was here? And they said, well, we saw the smoke. 
You see, we don't know how things can happen in life and how sometimes suffering may actually work for good. Now, I'm not saying that every time something bad happens, something good happens from the suffering. That's not what scripture teaches. But what I do know is that God walks with us in the suffering and he can use these events in our life for his purpose and his plan. Even the bad things in life can be used. And I think the third thing about suffering is this. There is beauty alongside of suffering. Yes, suffering is horrible and evil and can be painful, but we shouldn't focus on just the suffering and the suffering alone. We should also realize that there is beauty that walks alongside of suffering. How in the world can we get to the point where even when we're suffering, we see the beauty of life? We've been studying the life of King David in our morning Bible study. And King David was a man after God's heart. Everything that he did, he first consulted God and then he praised God. And there's this moment in 2 Samuel chapter 7, after he's been made king, that David just simply goes into the presence of God and praises God and thanks God and says, God, who am I? this little shepherd boy, that you should give so much blessing in my life. We should be like David, that every day when we wake up in the morning and every day when we go to sleep, we should thank God for the blessings that we do see in this life. I kind of look at it like this. It's like having a rain barrel. And every time we praise God for the beauty and the joy of this life and thank God for the beauties and joy, it fills up that rain barrel more and more. Of course, we know that there are leaks in the rain barrel that are sapping out the water. The water is leaking out of the rain barrel. But the more and more we position our hearts to thank God for all the blessings of this life, those blessings are will overflow more than the leakage in the rain bearer. And so when we do that daily, we fill up our life with his joy that even some of the most amazing suffering in life can't overcompensate for the joy that we feel of being in God's presence. And perhaps that's why in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn or who hurt or who suffer or experience tribulation. Because even in the midst of that, we can draw closer to God and thank God for all the blessings that we have in life. That's how we see the joy in the midst of all the craziness of the world. I remember years ago when I was in seminary, I was doing what they call clinical work. It wasn't like clinical psychology, but it was at a clinic. And these were people who were simply there and... Part of my job was to go and visit with them and talk about Jesus. And I remember this one lady who was in that clinic and she was in a lot of pain. She could barely get out of bed. Most of the time she spent in bed lying in pain. And I, I felt so bad for her. And I went to visit her and was going to tell her how much Jesus loved her. And I remember her saying, how much she loved Jesus. And even though that she was in pain and in this bed, she would pray for people, she would love people, and she felt closer to God now at this moment of her life than she'd ever felt. And I remember her ministering to me because I just didn't know it was possible that she could be in as much pain that she was in and still experience the love and the joy of God, but she did. In the midst of all that suffering, she was a light that shines in the darkness for this poor seminary student that was afraid to go talk to her and was heart was filled with joy after talking to her. See, that's what happens. The more you fill your heart with the things of God, the more you can spread those things to the world, the hurting world around us. And there are times when people will notice that. There will be times when people will see your joy and they'll wonder, where in the world does that joy come from? And that's what Peter alludes to as we continue reading in verse 15. He said, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks 
you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with great gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Peter says two things. First of all, when people ask you how in the world it is that you can have joy in the midst of suffering, be prepared to give the answer. And of course, we know what the answer is. The answer is Jesus, that Jesus walks beside us in the suffering, that Jesus holds our hand in the suffering. And the more that we suffer, there are times when God draws us closer to him and that even creates more joy. So we should have that hope within us. And whenever but anybody sees us in the midst of our suffering, having joy, we should be prepared to give an answer as to why we have joy. But Peter goes on to say, but don't do this with an attitude of superiority. Do this with an attitude of humbleness and respect. My friends, we can't walk in anyone else's shoes. So when we see people suffering, we can't say, well, this is how I got through suffering. We should simply give an account for why we have hope and then also walk alongside them when they are going through suffering. And when blessings happen, we should help turn that suffering into hope. Many people try to equate suffering with their own suffering. And then you get this game of, well, I've suffered more than you. No, I've suffered more than you. That's not what Jesus wants us to do. He simply wants us to walk alongside people in midst their suffering, be their hands and feet in the midst of suffering. Help them to see Jesus in the midst of suffering. For many years, we've done a summer camp and during COVID, it kind of wound down, but while we're winding it back up again to see if we can do another summer camp. And on the last day of camp, we typically have this thing called campfire and at campfire, people will stand up and share a little bit about their faith and how God's walked alongside them in the midst of their faith. And sometimes I work with these children to help them craft the narrative about what it means. And a lot of times you'll get this thing about people saying, well, my suffering is more than your suffering and your suffering is more than my suffering. And they play this game to see whose suffering has outdone somebody else's. And I have to work with them to show that God loves all people at all times. And even if you don't suffer, God is with you. I remember this one um, young man, probably a junior or a senior, who got up to share his faith story. And he said, you know, I've, I've lived a pretty good life. My parents love me. I I love Jesus. He's in my life. I don't have a lot of suffering. But even in the midst of that, I know that Jesus loves me and cares for me and has walked with me in all the aspects of my life. And I thought, man, this is one of the best faith stories I ever heard. But you see, that leads us to the final part. When you're able to have hope in the midst of suffering, people will notice. And that's something that you can share with the world because the world when they see suffering, they only see evil. They only see bad things and they don't like suffering. They think suffering is bad. And so they're trying to do everything in their power so that there is no suffering in your life. And sometimes if they don't see God in their life, in the midst of suffering, they can spiral downward into this pit of despair. So suffering becomes extremely excruciating and painful. It's not only the pain of suffering, but this idea that there is no reason or purpose behind suffering. And it just draws them down farther and farther in the midst of suffering. But Peter goes on in verse 17. He says this, he says, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil for Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body to be made alive in the spirit. Christ suffered to bring us to God. He didn't suffer to remove our suffering. He suffered to allow us to be in his presence in the midst of suffering, because if Christ had not suffered, then we wouldn't be redeemed. And if we hadn't been redeemed, 
we would not then be in the kingdom where God has a plan for us, even in the midst of suffering. And yes, even sometimes he uses our suffering as part of his eternal, his, his, his eternal plan. The world has this belief, and this is true, the world has this belief that somehow when you become a Christian, you won't suffer anymore. And I don't know where they get this belief, but perhaps it's all the caricatures on TV. I remember watching the show recently about a detective and he goes to investigate a murder. And it was at one of these churches that handles snakes and drinks poison. And it's this caricature of this pastor and this ha ha moment that, of course, you know, the real world is that when you get bit by a snake, you die. And the real world is that there is no poison that can kill or that when you drink poison that you will die. And this poor fool believed that because he was a Christian, he could handle snakes and drink poison and wouldn't die. And that, my friends, is a perversion of this little tiny section in Mark where it could be interpreted that way, but that's not the way to interpret that scripture. That scripture basically says that Jesus, the power of Jesus is stronger than even snakes or poison, but you shouldn't put God to the test. Yes, it's true that Paul was shipwrecked and was bit by a viper and survived it because of the blessings of God. And there are times when God does amazing, miraculous things in our life, but we shouldn't put God to the test. But somehow that translates to the world, that the world believes that Christians believe that whenever you have something that could potentially harm you, you won't be harmed as a Christian. That's not true. What the Bible teaches is that God will be with you in the midst of all things. Yes, there are times when he does miracles and saves us in amazing ways. But he does it for his glory and his plan. And we have no control over God when those moments happen. And there is no command in scripture that you should pick up snakes or drink poison. What the command of Jesus is, is to love him in all things, to serve him in all things, to serve the world in all things. And yes, there will be suffering in life. But when the suffering happens, God does not abandon us abandon us in the suffering. He walks with us in the midst of the suffering. And sometimes in those situations, there are amazing stories that can be shared to the world about God's great mercy and love and plan. Christians don't believe that a strong faith will stop, suf stop suffering. But what we do believe is that because Jesus suffered, and it was a suffering unlike any human could ever suffering because he did that suffering. We will never have eternal suffering. We will never suffer so much that we are abandoned by God because it has nothing to do with us and how well we suffer, or how poorly we suffer. It has everything to do with Jesus and how he suffered because our suffering doesn't redeem us. What redeems us and brings us into the kingdom is his suffering. Our sins were washed away by his suffering. Our life was redeemed because of his suffering. We are not lost to God because of his suffering. His suffering, God's suffering that washes over our suffering and redeems us and purifies us and makes us part of God's eternal plan. We can't understand it, but we also can't deny it. That suffering is a part of our life. I'm not saying to go out and suffer. There are things that are very horrible in this life, and I would not wish that upon anyone. I do not like suffering. But what I am saying is that if you follow Jesus, he lightens the load of suffering because of his suffering. I think about JFK out there on the farm at the J6 ranch, building this house, suffering, and maybe it was something he'd never experienced before. But it helped strengthen him. It helped mold him and it helped shape him. Later on in life, he would fight uh, and his, his aircraft would be shot down and he would be rescued and he would come back again to Arizona to heal from that. He went to the Arizona Hot Springs, the Castle Hot Springs to recover from that one. He kind of had a love affair with Arizona, as many of us do, but many people don't. <laughs> many people see Arizona as suffering.
that they need to cling to Jesus to get through the heat. I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is this. God is with us in the midst of suffering. No matter what it is, he is there. He is with us in the midst of all those things. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you that you are walking beside us in every moment in life, the good times and the bad times, and even in the suffering. Help us to see the beauty of you in all things. In your name we pray. Amen.